Hello, hi everyone. Welcome to Surji Dada. So back to the clinical series. Today we have a very interesting case. But the more interesting is that I have an opportunity where my residents will be presenting to me the case. So I have with me Dr. Senti Sharma from PGI Rotar and Dr. Surinder from Nalgonda Government Medical College. So welcome to Surji Dada and uh, tell us about this patient. So do you know students in this series? we have a comprehensive discussion a concise but crisp discussion about the patient presentation the complaint the, the ways to uh, manage these patients so we have two series where in one we are going for the surgical videos and one we have started this for the residents and the bbs students because they find it very difficult to approach the patient clinically so off to you guys i would be asking you that what is and uh, present me the brief clinical scenario of this and what are the chief complaints that we have to look into sir this uh, good morning sir sir actually uh, uh, this is a long chronic case of uh, chronic case of which is long chronic on a pti and it basically comes from the uh, abdominal pain uh, along with the uh, hematemesis basically uh, bleeding and vomiting and along with the uh, chest pain uh, basically a heartburn so Heartburn during uh, night time, sir. So, like, it might be a typical surgical series. Uh, patient had severe heartburn and uh, pain in the uh, uh, stomach. So, it's very common for the medical graduates to fumble during the, the clinical presentations, and this is what is the reason we have started. So, this is a patient who presented to us in ER with the complaint of hematemesis. So, what is hematemesis? It is emesis of blood. Along with that, he had mild epigastric discomfort and the, you can say, retrosternal burning chest pain. So this is the area where the patient is having pain and along with that, this patient is having hematemesis. Now, I will ask you a first very important question. What is hematemesis? Is it upper GI bleed or is it lower GI bleed? So basically upper GI bleed. Okay, so for all the audience, let me tell you that what is the designation for upper GI and lower GI. If the source of bleeding is proximal to the ligament of trees, that is what is known as upper, upper GI. GI. And if it is distal to the ligament of trees, that is lower, lower GI. GI. So did you ask or did you inquire about the melina or episodes of melina? Now just see. This patient is giving a history of black stools and this is very important because melina is there. Now a lot of us believe that melina is lower GI mm -hmm. thinking that is coming from the per rectum. Right. But let me tell you melina is mostly upper GI why the acid in the stomach interacts with the blood mm -hmm. that is the heme part and it oxidizes it to acid hematin. Mm -hmm. This interaction of blood and the acid is getting a lot of time. Why? Because this blood and acid is traveling around the entire small intestine, entire large intestine. So there's a lot of time for oxidation and that is why you have that black tarry stools. Mm -hmm. So melina is not a stool. It is black tarry precipitate of blood. So whenever we confuse it with the, you can say black stools. So can you tell me a test which is there to differentiate? I will tell you. The test is goic test. Goic test is a test which actually differentiates between the black stools versus the melina. Because of the peroxidase activity, it is positive for melina, but not for the black stools. Second is, black stools are well-formed stools. So if a patient is on iron supplementation, he will always have those well-formed stools. But melina is not a stool. It's a, you can say, concentrate of blood. So it will always have the pitch tari consistency. So this is one thing. Now, let us move to the clinical diagnosis. So what are the, you can say, uh, what are the investigations which have been done in support of this? So why are you saying that it is a case of peptic ulcer disease? Can you tell me something like, have you seen that endoscopy reports, etc., anything like that? Uh, yes, sir, we saw endoscopy reports. Uh, so like, uh, we might think it's an ulcer. Okay, so let me tell you about the endoscopy reports. When we talk about endoscopy, the upper GI endoscopy for this patient reveals esophagitis as well as enteral gastritis with RUT positive. Now, can anyone tell me what is RUT? Rapid urease test. Very good. Excellent. 
I want to make surgery more interesting, and that is why I called them. Otherwise, I could have given a synopsis in five minutes myself. So we'll talk about rapid urease test. If it is positive, this patient must have undergone a treatment for PP with PPIs. Mm -hmm. And now, then, since this is a five-year-old case, mm -hmm. we would tag this as intractable peptic ulcer disease. Now, I would ask you guys. I'd be very happy if you answer. What is criteria for intractable peptic ulcer disease? Intractable is basically a zoringer. No, intractable peptic ulcer. There is a time window after which we call eight, it eight weeks. After excellent, eight, excellent. Eight weeks. Very good, very good. So, do you know if a patient doesn't respond to medical treatment up to eight weeks or beyond eight weeks? That is what is known as intractable peptic ulcer disease, and this is an indication that we should be going for an acid reduction surgery for this. And the ideal surgery for this will be highly selective webotomy. In HSV, we are only removing the nerves of, you can say, crowfoot nerves along the proximal, leaving the distal 7 cm. Why? Because the distal 7 cm gives a motor supply. You know, pylorus is controlled mm -hmm. and antrum is controlled to some extent by the vagus. Vagus is a secretomotor. Anyways, we'll come to the treatment part later. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, can you tell me a classification to grade the peptic ulcer disease on endoscopy? As the, as the report is a group uh, grade A, but probably is grade B because uh, if some sedations are present over the mucosal layer. Okay. Uh, and okay. Get, get them okay. 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 Uh, okay. Okay. That is that is okay. So my question was, tell me the classification. You are telling me about the gastritis. So I am asking, tell me the classification for peptic ulcer disease and the name of that disease classification is a forest classification. Forest classification. Now when we talk about forest classification, it deals into three grades: grade A, grade B, grade C. Grade A is an active bleeding ulcer, grade B is an intermediate stage where bleeding is not there and grade C is a healed ulcer. Mm -hmm. When you talk about grade A, now bleeding could be from arterial source. So 1A is an active pulsatile bleed. What is the significance of forest that it not only grades, it also signifies the prognosis of rebleed. So if it is 1A which is active pulsatile bleed, the rebleed risk is high. If it is 1B, again it is an Active non pulsatile. So, non pulsatile is a venous bleed. Venous bleed. So, again, beat arterial, beat venous, the risk of rebleed will be high. Yes. Now comes 2. So, 2 is the place where the mucosa is breezed, the vessel is visible, but it is not bleeding. So, non bleeding visible vessel 2A. 2B is the most common thing that we get to see, that is a clot. So, remember, a patient has had hematomasis. You went for endoscopy, you will definitely see an evidence, and that is what is you see a clot. So, adherent clot is 2B, and dear students, this is a most common finding that we get. Because most of the time, when we go for upper J endoscopy, you have to check this forest grading. So, most of the time, we get 2A, uh, 2B. What do you mean by 2B? Because clot has two failed. Either it can get dislodged and rebleed, or it can get healed. So, that is why the risk of rebleed is intermediate. Then we have grade C, 2C. What is 2C? A healing pigmented shallow ulcer. So this is now the risk has decreased and it is low grade. So this is about the forest. Now, when you talk about grade A or grade B, what do we mean by grade A, grade B? There is a classification which is known as Sydney's classification, which classifies, very good, which classifies this ulcer disease or you can say this gastritis into nine grades, nine mm -hmm. subtypes. We have type A. What is type A? Remember type A is autoimmune and this is the most common. Mm -hmm. Since it is autoimmune, there will be atroph antibodies to parietal cells. If there are antibodies to parietal cells, there will be atrophy of parietal cells and achlorhydria. Not only achlorhydria, if parietal cells are destroyed, Castle's intrinsic factor will also not be there and thus you have the megaloblastic. Mm -hmm. Since it is autoimmune, you also have pernicious anemia. Mm -hmm. There will be autoantibodies to the parietal cells. Now one more thing is antrum is spared in this case and do you know that type A is a variety where you have a higher risk of adenosine. Now type B is S. pylori associated. Then we have reflux gastritis because of the biliary reflux. This is commonly seen post gastrodiagnostomy. And then we have the erosive gastritis maybe because of alcohol, maybe because of NSAIDs. So you have to take that history also. Then we have stress induced gastritis where in, during the stress the blood flow to the GIT is reduced mm -hmm. and fundus is the most common site mm -hmm. where the ischemia starts. Mm -hmm. Now in this case it is enter, so it is not a stress induced yes. gastritis. We have uh, you can say phlegmatous gastritis which is due to bacterial infection, your granulomatous gastritis, there are a lot of things that we have. 
Now one very important thing is that you mentioned that patient is having severe heartburn. Now what is this due to? This is due to? Esophagitis. Excellent. Esophagitis. And why esophagitis? Because the acid will be coming up. Excellent. Can you tell me the types of esophagitis? What are the types? Sir, it's basically erosive and non-erosive. Erosive and non-erosive. Excellent. So erosive versus non-erosive is this. What is the difference between erosive and non-erosive gas esophagitis? In Erosive esophagitis, there is breach of mucosa, mm -hmm. submucosa, and non erosive inflammation is there, but breach is not there. Now, when we talk about erosive esophagitis, have you heard about Los Angeles classification? Yes. Okay. I will tell you about the Los Angeles classification. This is a classification for erosive gastritis, where we have four grades type A, type B, type C, type D. If you have a crack along the esophagus less than 5 cm long, maybe single, maybe multiple, that's grade A. If you have a crack more than 5 cm, single or multiple, that's a grade B. If you have a circumferential erosion less than 75%, that's a type C. And more than that, that's a type D. We also have one more classification which is known as Savery Miller classification. But remember only one, that's a Los Angeles, that's a very important, very important. Now, whenever we talk about this patient, now you have a diagnosis that this could be due to peptic ulcer disease. Can you tell me what could be a differential diagnosis for this? Can any other condition be associated with a similar profile? Because this is a long history, five years long history. Mm -hmm. Anything where you have increased, I'll give you a hint, increase in gastro levels. Sir, Zollinger. Excellent, Zollinger. excellent. So, Ellison syndrome. syndrome. ZES or Zollinger yeah, Ellison syndrome. Yes. Very good, very good. Zollinger Ellison syndrome or gastronoma is a condition where you have a tumor which is secreting more and more G. So, gastrin is simulated and gastrin is increased. So increased gastrin will in turn cause peptic ulcer disease. Now, I will tell you what is the classical difference. Why it is not a zollinger ellison syndrome clinically? Because in zollinger ellison syndrome, there is excess acid production. This acid will enter into the intestine because if it is in the stomach, it will go into the intestine. And the moment it goes into the intestine, it will cause neutralization of the intestinal juices. And thus this patient will have diarrhea, which patient is not having. So a classical presentation of zollinger ellison syndrome will be pain, Epigastric, discomfort, esophagitis, with diarrhea, malabsorption, weight loss, mm -hmm. and one more classical thing is that once you put a rice tube and do aspiration, the diarrhea will decrease. Why? Mm -hmm. Because you are aspirating out more and more, more and more of acid. Yes. One more classical thing when you check biochemically, there are patients who have the acid, basal acid outflow. So, bowel levels more than 10 to 15 milliequivalents per hour, that's a very high acid level. And if you do a vagotomy, the acid should reduce. Mm -hmm. But in a case of gastrinoma, the basal acid outflow, even after HS, you can say HS, we highly select a vagotomy, mm -hmm. it is more than 5 mini equivalents. So resting more than 5, even after the vagotomy, this is indicative of a gastrinoma-like profile. And if you have doubt, if the fasting gastrins are not beyond, you can say 1000, you have that uh, stimulation test. I'm not going to that. So remember, in a brief synopsis, what is this patient? This is a patient of intractable peptic ulcer disease and I have admitted this patient. We are planning a highly selective vagotomy. So I will be going for laparoscopic highly selective vagotomy. Why highly selective? Because we don't have to do a drainage. The another option is TVGJ, truncal vagotomy and gastrogenostomy. So if I go for a lap TVGJ, the disadvantage is that I will have to do a bypass. So if I do a truncal vagotomy, I will Dean, what is the difference between, can you tell me, truncal vagotomy and selective vagotomy? Uh, I will tell you. Yeah. So, vagus has two divisions, right and left. Right. Left is anterior, right is posterior. Right. The left goes down anteriorly and gives one hepatic branch. Right. The right goes down and gives a celiac plexus. Right. So, if you divide the vagus before the celiac plexus and the hepatic branch, that is known as truncal vagotomy. Right. If you divide it after that, that means you are dividing the nerve of letargics, that is known as the what we got me selective we got and if you're dividing only the crow foot branches leaving the distal seven that is what is highly selective but in highly selective you also have to dissect five to seven centimeter above the gj and find the criminal nerve of grassy which is the posterior funding nerve so dear students this was a crisp bedside discussion i'm very thankful for the students who actually uh, gave uh, the discussion and we are thankful to the patient who helped you people learn a lot of things. We should be very thankful to all the patients. And do you know when you are a resident or when you are a BBS graduate, you always fumble. 
but remember attempt that give clinical cases so that you develop more and more confidence because agar you are if you are not able to develop that confidence right now in future how will you present yourself in front of patients so my request to the young g uh, young generation gen z is that do a lot of clinical case postings do a lot of clinical work go to the wards give clinical case presentation that is the only way to come up otherwise you will never be able to develop any concept in surgery and in surgery if you are not conceptual you will never be finding the subject interesting so i hope you enjoyed